case you're one of those folks that uh, look through an album and you say, well, I like that title, that's interesting, and you've jumped ahead. We have entitled this The Day the World Turned Over, or Will Turn Over, and uh, Joshua's Long Day. But uh, I have to apologize to you. We started it on the back side of the last tape, and we left off on our last tape, and we were uh, speaking of the law of physics that proves that every force acts independently of every other. Now, while the Earth is spinning, a force which is independent of the force uh, causing this spin could be applied, affecting the polar regions, <clears throat> Uh, causing the earth to turn over upon a second axis independently of the polar axis of the earth without affecting in any degree its original spinning. Now, you can prove this to yourself. It can be illustrated very simply by taking a spinning top or a gyroscope uh, which can be turned over without affecting its spinning. The north pole could be uh, made to make a complete circle or one revolution without uh, returning to its former position while the earth continues to spin on its axis at the same time. Uh, through the uh, new motion given to the poles, uh, it keeps a given point on earth directly under the sun for the duration of this turnover. Now, I, I wish that there was somehow I had a blackboard and I could uh, uh, show you how all this it, uh, came about. But according to Professor uh, Totten and those, they figured that it took place in the year about 20, let's see, 2555 Anno Mundo. Uh, mundo, you know, meaning uh, the annual year. In other words, about 1400 and... 45 B.C., and uh, it was his and other people's contention this took place around December 21st to the 22nd, and it began approximately at 10.52, uh, 3 a.m. on a Tuesday. Now, that would naturally depend on what time zone that you were in. And so it shows the earth starting to turn, then around Tuesday, visualize the earth at two poles, uh, would be running parallel, let's say east and west, the earth would be over on its side. 10.52, uh, round Tuesday, it would be three quarters of the way over. Uh, and by Wednesday, it, it turned over more. And finally, by uh, Wednesday at 10.52, uh, the poles had flipped uh, and entirely changed positions. The north is now south, and the south is now north. But uh, now the temporary second motion given to the earth would not interfere with the effects uh, produced by the continuation of the spin of the earth. In other words, it wouldn't miss a lick as it went on. On its own axis, the only recognized change would be that the sun would appear to be in an apparently stationary position over the point uh, where uh, upon the earth the new axis would be established. Caused by the uh, turning of the poles, this relative position would be maintained even though the earth spun on its own axis as long as the ratio of the turning given to the poles uh, was such that it compensated for the surface movement at a given point directly under the sun. I'm probably about as clear as mud. But try to figure, uh, look at a globe, a map. And if you have one of those that rotates around, turns on its side, uh, while the earth would not miss a lick, it would still keep on spinning, and it would still be in its position. But you see how much more daylight that could give you? Now, it's not my purpose here to uh, say that this is what happened, because in all reality we do not know. But it's our objective here to try to show the relative position of the earth, the sun, and the moon, uh, and how it can be maintained as described by Joshua, Joshua without at least the earth's motion as it spins upon its axis. 
We know from the account here that's given by Joshua that the sun and the moon were about to go down in conjunction. The moon would thus be in line with this temporary new axis as the pole made one complete revolution. Also, the biblical account establishes the fact that an astronomical disturbance of a great intensity which preceded the beginning of the long day, and it said it was so severe that the great stones came down from heaven, and more and more of the enemies died from this shower of stones than were slain by the enemies of Joshua. Now then, the context clearly indicates that a tremendous uh, meteor shower preceded the event which caused the earth and the sun and the moon to remain in this relative position as described by Joshua. Now can you imagine, if you want to get away for just a minute from the the church, uh, the religious ideology of uh, uh, an excuse where your preacher, uh, in essence, he wouldn't say this, God knows he wouldn't, but in essence what the preacher's saying to you as Shazam. You know, God just spoke it into, a dish, uh, into existence, and that was so. I do not doubt that whether it was the Eternal or one of his adjutants or whether it was Michael, I don't know who brought it about, but I know that somebody with a great mind, with great calculation, possibly using great scientific calculators, uh, do you realize, let's say, I, I just, there was an article, I believe, that was in Spotlight not too long ago here that talked about this man who had invented a computer where he could take the DNA of a man and program him into it and he could tell you in the future what he would be like and just what he would do and where he would go with his scheming, scamming, planning, uh, just whatever. Now, can you imagine how invaluable that could be to a government who could sit down with this sophisticated equipment and actually see into the future as to what the individuals running a nation was going to do? Well, he was flim-flammed around. He was offered something like 25 a uh, million for it, and then the government, <laughs> they changed their mind, and, and he disappeared. But I believe that there's evidence here, if you want to just look at, uh, uh, as I've said before, let me use the analogy, uh, Christian scientists. I say, okay, Christian scientists. You mean that the Creator, the Heavenly Father, the Great Deity, the One, the Leader of all space, he is a scientist. He's scientific. He does things by science, by patterns, uh, by formulas. I times R equals E and Ohm's law. And, uh, and, and he sticks to a DNA pattern, uh, whether it's trees or bushes or animals or man, that there is a scientific, uh, predictable pattern that we can follow if we only have the intelligence to see it. Oh, yes. All right, well, this is what's going on here. This, this is, in other words, what I'm doing, I'm not trying to destroy anything. I'm trying to make and show that it is more marvelous than we ever in our wildest dream dreamed that it was. As I look back at these people, uh, we're talking about back at the turn of the century, the late, late 1800s, the early 1900s, and they were saying back then that all of this seemed to bring up some very interesting uh, questions here that did, uh, did we have some inner space visitors come into our solar system to shower the earth with these great meteoric uh, stones at the same time exert a tremendous influence upon our polar region causing the earth's axis to make some complete rotation. You see, my friends, I don't profess to be uh, a scientist uh, knowing everything, but I do know that in order to uh, affect our polar regions, uh, to upset our gravity, 
uh, to turn. Uh, see, visualize in your mind an orange, or let's take an apple, with a stem at the uh, top, and you know that little thing on the bottom we'll call the navel of the apple. Well, what it is, it, it, you got it literally while it's still spinning, it's rotating over on its side. Now, what great dynamic force could it be uh, other than uh, the sister planet Venus? And uh, it had to be something like that to cause the Earth's axis to make one complete rotation. So we find then as we go to reason about this, a field of force which is responsible for holding the axis of the Earth in its present position could have been momentarily interfered with with the close sweep of, uh, uh, of this, uh, what I, is called a sister planet. It, it, uh, a lot of people suspected it could be a comet or some uh, other celestial body of a high magnetic ore. Well, I believe that all inside of the house, the throne, the holy city that we have discussed, there is all of the power that anyone needs to affect this. With the power and the energy it exerts, it would be like a little kid that has a, a, one of these toy balloons that's filled with helium, where you can go along and just blow on it and it'll start to rotate in midair. So there was something, there had to be another celestial body that induced a secondary field of force here uh, acting upon the earth, uh, which itself it became like a magnet or two magnets with a positive side. Think about that, pointing at each other. Uh, well, let's say that it was, uh, which itself, let's say it was a magnet, uh, much of a, a great magnet uh, or magnetic impulse would act on like the armature of a motor, causing it to turn. The influence that was thus exerted upon the earth by a new field of force brought within the close proximity of this planet uh, would have none of the evil effects of direct contact between a celestial visitor and the earth, or, or it would nevertheless exert a great tremendous pull upon it. Now, when the earth had turned itself way over, it would continue on and complete the uh, uh, revolution of its natural spinning, even though the magnetic mass had passed on by uh, that time beyond the earth's orbit and right itself again in its original field of force. All of this could be possible. Uh, they thought, and I don't agree with the point, if a comet or a celestial body pass close by. Uh, but it would be too chancy if it was just another uh, celestial body interfering. But I'm talking about a celestial body that is driven, it is guided, and it is done purposely by an intelligent force and a direction that is beyond the scope and the imagination of anything. We, well, look, let's look at it this way. Look at all of these different pieces of machinery, uh, such as the cameras and all that equipment they sent up to Venus and Mars. Now, even in our primitive state, our scientists have the ability to open shutters, to close them, to get them to rotate, to turn over. They have limited powers over that. But we're talking about one here that is powered by a great extraterrestrial uh, knowledge who did it at the exact time in answer to uh, Joshua's prayer. And uh, like the Eternal says, I know your needs before you even ask him. He knew ahead of time. He had his watchers out. And they told him what's going on in this hemisphere. So this explains why this could be possible that this great celestial body that passed close enough to this earth, it would set up a powerful field of force. The fact that this uh, particular, as I say, uh, well, let's examine here uh, the fact that here, where else could this spectacular uh, meteorite shower precede the long day? 
it clearly indicates that there was some intelligence uh, behind all this. There was a heavenly visitor, and he did, uh, well, let's say this. He was a terrific marksman who was able to graze the earth's surface as it sped through the heavens and his path around or beyond the sun uh, in order to wipe out the adversaries in such close proximity, all of this being directed from space, or was it, as I said, you have the one other alternative. Uh, they talk about these meteorites and the showers and the stones. Well, we know once again how the translators always mess that up, and I suspect that it said rocks that rain from heaven. And I believe they left the E.T. off and it was rockets. And I'll tell you why I believe that. Because you see a great difference between that and, and uh, uh, what is prophesied for the days of, uh, of uh, uh, Ezekiel. When it talks about the great hordes of all of this world resurrected Babylonian empire shall come against God's earthly new and unwalled Jerusalem and uh, having uh, several pronged attacks uh, throughout the world at that period. But he talks about cubits he, of, of these stone-like things coming out of heaven. Uh, that is the broken up overcoat of the crust of the planet Venus that Job is talking about. And as I said before, when it breaks through our ionosphere, uh, that sudden impact, uh, which is like hitting concrete with no shield on, and uh, when it talks about brimstone, it's talking about sulfur. And I've proved to you beyond a shadow of a doubt, and anybody that doubts it, write to me, and I will. Uh, you might send a little uh, change along for mailing, and, and if you can, I'll send it to you for free. But I will send you a photocopy of what the scientists have proven that there's a thick layer of hard, compacted sulfur all over the surface of Venus. And they talk about there's two structures on Venus that pour this out day and night. So is this the combined pollution or waste from the inside? Well, in essence, well, I apologize for the noise of the phone in the background. I forgot to shut it off in our little uh, sound booth of sorts here. But uh, so you see, it gives the size and the cubits of those so-called stones, and it gives us the other clue as talking about brimstone, which is sulfur. And so we find that as the same incident that I prophesy and say will happen again, probably before this century is over. But if it's not, it'll be not far beyond uh, the beginning of uh, the year 2000. But I think that the Bible covers all the ground that all the libraries cover, but not so bulky and so exhaustive as it would to destroy the practical value. So we have in one small combat compact volume here, what I'm saying, uh, which thousands of people carry around with them in their daily tasks and many homes and a copy occupies a place on the table or the bookshelf. And uh, But human ability has never succeeded in so condensing knowledge elsewhere as has been accomplished in the book that we call the Bible. How does it happen then that men seem to accomplish the task so perfectly in the Bible? If these uh, men of the Almighty, if they were not inspired, they showed powers of mind, they had a range and technology that was uh, infinitely superior to the best scholarship uh, of today. But they were inspired, condensed, portable, usable. All of these things we should expect of a divine revelation. The Bible is all of this and to a degree which has never ever been approached by any other literature nor by any other schools or, or think tanks or any these bunch of over-educated idiots that we have of today. So it is the glory of the most prestigious 
schools or great palaces of learning that we have in our day and age that these clowns, they have the audacity to stand and realize and note the word, to criticize the Bible, who among them, though, would undertake to produce one. No, we always ridicule the things we fear. We ridicule the things that we don't understand. It's the best defense. So one is reminded of the description of such a school in the book of Revelations, uh, which we're going to get to very shortly. I've been procrastinating. This has been a, a love in the back of my mind. But it, uh, you remember how uh, Revelation starts out? Thou sayest, I'm in rich and I'm increased in goods, and I have need of nothing. And know not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou may be clothed, that is a shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice, you open the door and I'll come in unto you. And I will sup with him and he with me. And to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcome and have sat down in my father's house in his throne. He who has eyes to see and ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Revelations, third chapter, 17 and 22. And please understand the old Greek allegory there that is talking about refers to you as gold that is retried as fire in the furnace, in the furnace of, uh, uh, of uh, adversity. Uh, I've seen this in a smelter in Arizona one time where they had to keep cooking it over and over and taking slag and dross and stuff that was valueless out of and away from it. And then he refers here to the white raiment, clothing yourself in the laws and the knowledge and the purity of the eternal and be not distracted by the crap that's going on in this world and that damnable glass toilet and all of their filthy rotten shizen that they're always spewing out upon us the ignorant, gawking masses that sit there uh, drinking Miller Low Life and, and eating potato chips and drooling down the front of us. I don't mean to be insulting. I know that those of you who are listening uh, to the sound of my voice that you're not involved in things like that. But when we think what a triumph and scholarship to sit with Christ, the great teacher, and His throne, where? Where? Who else has told you in the last 2,000 years, and if I boast, I boast of Christ, and I boast of His Holy Spirit, and boast of His Comforter, that He said that when He went away, He would leave it behind with us, and I boast of Him who answers uh, the prayer and honors His Word, who says, Knock, and I'll open any door. Ask, and you shall receive. And I have invited him into my house, my temple, because he is not rude. He never walks in anybody's house without permission. So when you think of that, you see, I'm not a rapture preacher. I do not preach chicken ninety. It just like a lot of these so-called would-be spirit-filled people. I don't think I, I don't know if I could count on one hand any of those that were so spiritual, these tongue-talking Pentecostal calisthenics that would sit down and talk about anything besides their experiences, that we, they do not want to seem to get into the depth of this Word. This is why, well, when he talks about going to his temple, going to his house, we'll be caught up to meet him. This is why he refers in the parable of the tabernacle that was in the wilderness. There's the outer court, the inner court, the holy place, the holy of holies, and then the holiest of holies. So you see, when the uh, ram's horn uh, blew the signal, there was one signal for the thundering unwashed herd. 
that they could all come into the parameter of the temple courtyard. But there was many that could not go beyond that. And there was priests that could go beyond that. Then there was priests that could go beyond the priests. So you, my friend, you make the selection for the election and you make your calling for the high place. You make it sure. Because I tell you what, my dear friend, Sometimes I may bore you to tears, I may get off on tangents, but of this I'm sure. You cannot feed others till you learn yourself. And you had better believe that what you are doing now and what you will do for the rest of your life with what time you have left, it will affect your position in all eternity. That I know for a fact. Now, Charles Kingsley was better uh, than his next-door neighbor, um, the reader of Shakespeare knows that Shakespeare, while the whole earth is left to wonder who Shakespeare the man was outside of his books, it is a truism so universal that it is not necessary to labor the statement. But if God is the author of the Bible, then the personality of God must be written into it. Now, surely in this case, the uh, God, the Heavenly Father, the Yahweh, the consciousness, it leaps out of the pages of the Bible and it should seize the very mind and the heart and every soul and a cell and fiber of your very being from the highest to the whitest manifestations and glory of the eternal in the Elohim of universal creation to uh, from where He's label as Jehovah. Uh, go look that up in your concordance. He has all of these different names that attest to His glory and His power and His love. And uh, the, uh, He's the Eternal, the King of Israel. To Jesus, the Redeemer of Israel and Savior of men, the ultimate King of Israel. He shall sit upon the throne of His fathers, David, and He's going to rule over you and I, which constitutes the house of Jacob forever the God consciousness and the revelation of God becomes more and more intimate and clear. Those of us who stay straight and walk on the path, for it says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, uh, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. You'll find this in Hebrews 4.12. So you think you're shucking the eternal. Hey, don't kid yourself. And so we find the first pregnant word, shall we call them in the beginning, the Eternal created the heaven and the earth to the last testimony. Behold, I come quickly. For the Eternal is in the Word, and the Word is replete in the living personality of the Eternal, ever-living, almighty Yahweh God. Now, since the Bible's a revelation to man, then we should expect results from the reading and the studying and the contemplating upon this Word. Uh, it should be the last thing in your mind when you go to bed. It should be the first thing getting up. And I believe as you grow more steeped in it, you'll wake in the middle of the night and you'll start to contemplate and wonder about these things. And so the study of the Word that can be found in the connection with the reading uh, of this more than any other literature, the Bible stands alone. It's effective upon the personal and the experience of the reverent student, upon the uh, character of the nations and the races. And if the Bible is very indeed the revelation of God, then why shouldn't we bring it into actual relationship with Him? The regeneration experience has worked in transforming and influencing uh, millions of generations of God's people throughout ages and eons and times periods. And we have His testimony to which it is to be found in the Bible literature, in all the literature of the Christian church, if you'll forgive me for using an analogy like that. But to me, the church of the eternal is the ecclesia, the kaya, the called out, those who are separated uh, from this this whore, this whore bitch out here, this substitute uh, who would stand in for the bride of Christ. But a lot of people, they can't tell the difference between the whore and the bride. They can't tell the difference between the whore and their wife because they equate it all the same on a carnal level. So we find an unconscious presentation here 
of its field in history and biography. It is a positive experience of millions at the present time, and it should be feared. But however, under the biblical criticism, which has so largely replaced the Bible reading and Bible study in this day and age, uh, this experience is less common than formerly. We find that John of Apostle, even back in his day, he records his testimony. As many as received him, to them gave he, uh, he gave uh, he the power to become the sons of God, even to them who believed upon his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Now, I'm going to tell you, friends, look that up. And I tell you what, you could contemplate on that, you could pray over that for days. We're talking about John 1, 12 to 13. He's talking about some people. I think like an Excedrin headache. Somewhere in the loins of your great, 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 great grandparent, there was a special seed that keeps on passing on from generation to generation when periodically you, Yes, I'm talking to you. Who were selected out, especially, uh, as he said, he who he foreknew, he did prepick. He who he did prepick, uh, he sanctified you, he justified you, he glorified you. And he said, if I'm for you, who can be against you? Now look at a lot of you, you kooks who have gone this far to listen to all this kooky stuff. Spent your hard-earned money for it. Think. Look around in your family. Do you feel kind of alone when Abraham walked with the Eternal? It was just he and the Almighty. Didn't say nothing in there about his cousins or aunts or uncle or kith or kin or kinfolk. Now Paul asked the questions, How then shall they believe on him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Romans 10 and 14. We may add now that how can they preach unless they have understanding of the written eternal word of the Almighty, for the Scriptures are truly the only word of life. Where the Bible itself, it fills every requirement expected of a book given by the divine revelations of the Almighty, eternal Yahweh. Now, I think I have spent enough time on that what about Joshua and his long day? We'd make a note here. We find that uh, I want to remind you that once again this comes from Professor Totten. And he wrote a book. It was called Joshua's Long Day and the Dial of Ahaz. He was able to demonstrate the actuality of the long day itself and uh, he went into greater detail than we'll be able to in what little time that we have left in this album. But on the basis of these four accounts, Joshua 10, 1 to 43, Isaiah 38, uh, 1 to 22, Second Kings 21 to 11, and Second Chronicles 32, 24 to 26, of uh, these two events. Now we're talking about Joshua's long day. We're talking about the earth. Uh, turning over as true history. We've investigated them against uh, the cycles of heaven which still continue to score off uh, times and seasons and found that they are in accord with these cycles and their agreement and their chrono uh, chronological order. It's therefore next in order to uh, premise our discussion by a statement of the results that we uh, uh, arrive at and by what conclusions and so forth. And, and we know that this is a fact because a lot of people say, well, uh, what about Stonehenge? What about those things left behind and Dayrap and Persia? And, and uh, what about the pyramids and uh, uh, all of these different things that were supposedly in England? Uh, uh, the, uh, the big stone circles. And you find uh, a lot of people not aware of them. There, there's like... Uh, uh, 600 uh, of these round stone edifices that are that are all over England, and there's found leftover samples of them here in the states that people have spoke of and so forth. And uh, the people of old, they used Stonehenge and these other places that I'm speaking of, 
as a sidereal calendar, knowing exactly what day they could start their planting and their harvesting and cultivating and so forth. But uh, so we find that all these elements then that they're verified and have been down through the course of history and it's impossible to give any idea or adequate idea of the scope of the calculations which have conspired to bring out this uh, uh, astrochronological uh, results that are enumerated in this talk and we find that the mere figures are of no interest save to those that would be the verifier and even to them that the eventual results will suggest far better ways of testing their accuracy than a mere going over the tedious steps of the original and the complex operation. And there, if the results are correct then, they find that we must answer every other test uh, which thus can be put on them in perfect confidence and, and will acquaint themselves in the respect that they're now given in this world. We find that one of the chief points to the scientific world is the inexplicable uh, fixing of the elements of what they call uh, Beth Horon. Uh, conjunction in modern terms uh, and, and from a modern starting point as well as in biblical terms and a biblical starting point. We try to get the two of them here to run parallel for proof and for the sake of a few who will be equally concerned in the view it is sense and so far to give them the entire compass of the cycle which spans all of this uh, human history. Now to recapitulate therefore in uh, anticipation of our discussion, Joshua's long day actually consisted now of 23 and a third hours added to the 24 regular hours which marked the day, the winter solstice of the year, as we said before, uh, 2,555 a.m. The autumnal equinox beginning of which year was 3,333 solar months ago, uh, which uh, uh, Totten said, which would be reckoning from the Sunday of September uh, 22nd, 1889 A.D. is what he said. Now he goes on to, and he said that there were 47 and a third hours were considered in two full days by the calendar keepers of that time in a single day, which was therefore uh, intercalculated by them, was more or chronologically ahead of the truth by 40 minutes. In fact, of which the Hebrews certainly seem to have preserved a careful record down to the days of Hezekiah, which by an additional operation of divine power, the calendar was set absolutely right. The days thus covered between the sunset of the day in question were the 24th and the 25th days of the fourth civil month of 2,555 a.m., uh, the 113th and 114th day of that calendar year, and the 91st and 92nd day from the 2,555 complete solar year from creation, which was dating, from the autumnal uh, equinox to equinox, according to the universal method of all of the different ancient, na uh, ancient nations, even right down to Rome. Now, then the Beth Horn, uh, Horon uh, conjunction, it was due to 12 to 13 minutes past the 11 a.m. on the first day identified, but owing uh, to the stopping or stoppage, shall we say, of all relative motion between the three bodies was delayed about a whole day, 23 and a third hours, and thus did not occur until 10.32 to 33 a.m. the next day, which was the Wednesday that we have mentioned. And the uh, silence of intercalculation covered a part of both Tuesday and Wednesday, and the next sunset was the beginning of Thursday. And so then when we add in here the elements of the sundial incident uh, during the Hezekiah reign are as follows. It occurred in the absolute instant of autumnal equinox in the year of the world, get this, of the world, uh, 3,293 at the end of the astronomical year of 3294. The events took place particularly at high noon. Kind of like that movie, I'm going to meet you at high noon. Now, so about seven and a half minutes before 12 o'clock, as we can reckon, so uh, 
uh, taught, in the, this is the way he put it, uh, the day uh, was uh, 1,200 and, or I'm sorry, 1, 202, 744th from creation. <coughs> Excuse me. I know that that's, <laughs> that's kind of getting a little heavy duty. But I like to bring that out. For what? You see, don't you see the intelligence, the people that we had in times past who were great teachers? And you remember, now a lot of people say, hey brother, oh don't you love the Lord? Are you a born again Christian? Are you prayed up and paid up and ready to go up? You know those people make me puke. I don't even have time for these innocuous people like that that really get off on me when I start talking about the ancient civilizations of Mu and the Mayan and these Aztecs that talk about in their historical records of the calendars and their understanding they could go back over one million years ago. Are they superior to the Semitic, Adamic, Christian man, if you like? Are they and were they to surpass us always in knowledge and understanding of creation and the eternal and His great divine plan? No, I think not. We are held back only by our pasteurized pastors and teachers. Well, so much for my ranting and raving. So they talk about this 1,202,744th from creation. They said it was a Wednesday, the 18th day of the first civil month of 3,293 a.m. The ancient Hebrew cycle of the moon through which was involved in this incident could be mentioned because she was just short of her entrance into the fourth quarter. Therefore, in the moment, absolutely was below the eastern horizon. There was no Palestinian landmarks by which to fix her place. That she too reversed in her orbital motion cannot be denied. Uh, for her present place in arc, or in other words, reverses uh, through both these events, and Joshua strikes creation's first hour without air, this could not have happened had she not been equally and relatively influenced in Hezekiah's day as well as that in the day of Joshua. Oh, I wish I had time and I wish I had the tape where we could go back and talk about this mysterious planet, moon, or, or the moon. Uh, some have called it a space station. Some called it a spaceship, the moon. They talk about civilizations that dwelled inside it, dwelt upon its surface. Oh, boy, I, one of my favorite things to talk about. But what's the most important thing? What do people want to hear? And anyway, I, I'm sorry, there I go again. So let's go now to the chronological conditions here. Don't you wish we had somebody like this professor talking around today to teach us somebody who had the ability to put things in a chronological order and to think and use all of his uh, facilities in the many, many different linguistic and scientific fields and help us to tie this all up into a bundle? Well, this we can do. If any of us ever reach any greatness, it's because we're standing on the shoulders of great men who preceded us. So when we talk about the chronological conditions imposed upon the problem by the sacred records required that this mid-heaven conjunction, as it was called, should have occurred during the first five years of Joshua's occupation of the land. Uh, that would be 2-5-5-3-2-58 a.m. We're talking about in this time period. And within these years, the special geographical astronomical conditions required that by uh, reversing the cycle of the three bodies from their present position, their relative places uh, should have been as such as to bring the sun over uh, Gibeon 
and the moon over uh, uh, Ajalon, A-J-A-L-O-N, within the set chronological limits. Uh, that is the question that was to be settled was whether astronomy would corroborate history. Now, the battle of Beth uh, Huron uh, must have occurred during the first five years which succeeded the passage uh, of the Jordan, which he figured to be Friday the 10th of the 7th uh, civil month, uh, 2,553 a.m., which had preceded the division of the land. Now Caleb was 40 years old when set out with the spies uh, in Joshua 14 and 7 and was 85 when the land was divided. Find that in the 14th verse or 14th chapter and the 10th verse. Hence we see here that the division was effected five years after they occupied it for Caleb must have spent 40 of his remaining 45 years in the wilderness with the rest of the great host. Now from the middle of 25.13 a.m. We left off on the other side in the middle of 25.53. Uh, that was the time period of their entrance into Palestine. So we see the Battle of Beth Haran could not have occurred after the division of the expressly uh, of that event uh, or before that event we're talking about the dividing of the land as it was expressly told by Joshua here in 11.23 that the land rested from war, nor, of course, could the battle have occurred before because of the passage of the Jordan. We are thus confident that a very narrow chronological limit here, even before we undertake the crucial task of pure astronomy in order to find out the exact date which satisfy the rigid conditions directly imposed upon the record itself. Now, we go back and we search the records here for a reverence to the moon by an anomalous. Uh, but right here it is proper and uh, a parapose to insist that the mere mention of the moon under the circumstances involved in Betaron uh, is a positive and prime facia guaranteed, he said, of historical accuracy in the whole account. And it was in the midday that Joshua found himself in Betaron and and the moon, by, both by modern calculations and by the tenure of the record, was so near to the sun that the portion of her orbit, uh, where she is always visible, even at night, there is no human probability that she could have been mentioned at all in the fact that the case both warned it and demanded it as a necessity here. For about 27 and a half hours, both proceeding and following a conjunction, the moon has no face no phases, and the Bible account places her within 15 minutes of the sun. Didn't you? Don't you find it surprising how really scientific and mathematical this Bible really is? So we find here bathed in such a meridian sun glare that she would not have been visible even to uh, great telescopes back in this man's day. Uh, which at that time they were called the Lick Telescope. And then we have those on uh, Palomar and some of the great uh, scopes throughout this world. But the veracity of the fact that uh, will never reasonably account even for her incidental introduction into the record of the stupendous effort of the solar system. Now the real effect of such a stoppage the effect of the stoppage of all relative motion among the three bodies for uh, what they said for about a whole day was merely uh, to introduce a single week day into the calendar and thus was affected by the Hebrew priest then and there in a separate and distinct measure of the duration of the stoppage itself. But in so far as the actual measure of the celestial arc is concerned, it could not and it did not uh, lengthen the then current year 2555 or the lunar year 2634, uh, fourth as it would be called, uh, by anything whatsoever. That is why the year, the lunation, 
and the terrestrial rotation were severely uh, complicated and they were suffered to resume their speech at the same point as uh, uh, the zodiac which they would have reached had the incident not occurred. So we find here what it is within the power of the Eternal Almighty. He had enforced this silence on the spheres for a whole year instead of a single day. The cycles themselves would bear no evidence thereof. Today, save only uh, to mark as how they do, the fact and the date of the conjunction of which it was recorded uh, to have occurred, to have began and ended for the logical and astronomical and carrying out the mandate required no change in the relative uh, arc measurement while the science, uh, silence continued. Now, I think as I'm running out of time, and I think a lot of these uh, uh, things I would like to go into in greater detail, but I'm sure that there's a great many of you who are listening who are probably very bored by it, and say, all right, let's get down to the battle itself. It was at this juncture that the men of Gibbon said hastily to Joshua the news that they were surrounded and they besought his immediate, if not sooner, assistance. You have to understand there was no time to be lost and Joshua's preparation seem to have been so quickly made as to have enabled him to believe to leave Gilgal with the setting sun. The sunset of his departure was of course the commencement of a day and by this professor's calculations was on a Tuesday. Commencement according to the original and then the universal method of keeping the calendar so Joshua marched all that night. How would you like to march all night and then have to fight a battle the next day? You better hope that the Eternal interceded. Uh, search says out in Joshua 10, 9. And as, and as uh, uh, armies uh, move and they reach Gibbon about 20 miles away to the southwest, probably about dawn. Now you got to remember the night, it was, well, it was pitch dark. And the moon was uh, going new, as they say, and the surprise of the Amorites seemed to have been complete. Now the uh, leadership of Moses and uh, Joshua cannot be doubted, and the whole tenure of this particular account implies an adherence uh, to strategical principles of the highest order by the latter. Now his first aim was to relieve uh, Gibeon. His second was to cut off a retreat towards Jerusalem, and his third was to drive the aliens into the broken country. He was northwest of Gibeon when he started from Gilgal. But the account of their flight shows that the aliens were forced to retreat along the very line that Joshua must. Therefore, they have made a wide detour to the southeast haven't actually come upon them from their own flank and rear. Now, you can't help but doubt that many modern armies would sustain such a surprise with, uh, I don't believe they could equal that. And it was certainly too much for the Amorites, so as they say today, using a vernacular, it would kind of blow their mind. But from the very first, they were overcome with a great slaughter which began at Gibeon. Now, uh, for true to the word of the Eternal, which in spite of the urgency of this preparation, here we find Joshua uh, had not failed to consult. He feared them, not knowing beforehand that they had been delivered into his hands, that not a man of them could stand before him. Joshua 10.8. Now Joshua, of course, here he fought with the odds in his favor. But surely, with no sure chance than anybody who also uh, has the God of what he was termed as the Hebrew, the Sabaoth, upon his banners. He surprised them. He outflanked them. He reversed, in fact, and so cut off 
from their safest base of operation, Jerusalem, a city not wholly reduced until uh, David's time. There was nothing left of them uh, to seek individual, uh, but to seek individual safety, I'm trying to say, in the wilderness. It was more than what the soldiers called panic. In other words, we'd, I'd say we'd call it utter chaos. Uh, and that was panic that dominated such a great route for a forgotten God. The only God and a God unknown to any but unto only the seed of Abraham here had stretched forth his hand and there was none to stay it. They couldn't stand up against it. And then the eternal, he discomfited them. Uh, he blew them away, so to speak, before Israel once again. Uh, go back to prove my point. Read uh, Psalm 68, where he ends up and he talks about this great mount ship he has, that he has armies in it, and he chases armies, and he scatters them. means he destroys them. Now, so this great almighty Yahweh, he... He unnerved them. He scattered them. Right before his people Israel, he slew them with a great slaughter. First at Gibbon as they fled by the way of uh, Beth Horon. Uh, this was a place that was four or five miles to the northwest, uh, midway uh, somewhere in between uh, Gibeon and Ajalon. A J A L O O N. Uh, with uh, uh, which latter's place was only about, let's see, seven or eight miles apart. So then we find here that the Lord of hosts, he, he, he's pursued them and he smote them uh, even to uh, Zika and unto uh, Makinda. So Joshua and his hosts in the meanwhile, they're closely profited by this supernatural assistant, to say the least, from the extraterrestrials, and here they're following the retreating army. In Joshua 5:10, the battle was probably of its height uh, towards around 11 uh, o'clock a.m. and it raged around uh, Beth Horon, and there was uh, severe convulsions of nature, which had already begun to manifest before that circumstance is detailed in verse 11, where we learn that it came to pass that they fled before Israel. And they were going down to Beth Haran, and the Almighty here, uh, he cast down on the uh, uh, great stones. And I believe the word there was uh, aerolites, A-E-R-O-L-I-T-E-S. And there's some question about what this means. But uh, what it means, though, whatever they were, they came from outer space, from heaven, down upon them. And Azekai, and they died. And there was more which died with the hailstones, as I said once before, than were, uh, that died at the hands of the swords of the children of Israel. So now, this is where the long day without sunset and without any sunrise uh, this guy Joshua, he wasn't a quitter, and he knew that he had the he was on a roll, and he had the eternal with him, and he didn't want to go back and have his children or his children's children have to fight these people again, like the Almighty had told him back in Deuteronomy, uh, before thee I place seven nations mightier and greater than thou, uh, and he mentioned these nations here that they were having to kill off. And he said, I placed the Hittite, the Girgashite, the Amorite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, the Prezerite, the Canaanite. He said, go for it and have a day taught. No, he said, go cut the damn heads off. But they were disobedient. This is why you and I and our Ishmaelite neighbors over there, we are still vexed with these people. A lot of them called the Canaanites the great world international bankers. Another name for a merchant is Canaanite. And these banker merchants of the world are still causing these genocidal wars throughout the world. Oh, we need another Joshua. 
So anyway, by this time, Joshua, he must have been in the vicinity of the elevated central point of the broad extended battlefield here, and the moment had arrived to announce the, the outcome of the progeny, which was all uh, ready in progress, and the sun and the moon at this moment, uh, they figured and tautened it, I believe back around 11 a.m., was absolutely in the mid-heavens, equal distance to the east and west of Beth Haran's and Joshua's own zenith, and about 13 minutes of times apart, and etc. But I think that uh, this is going on, and it, it, it's getting too heavy. But uh, if any of you are really into this, as I am, and uh, I don't make any promises, but if you write to me, I could probably dig you out some material on it. So I appreciate you so much, and any of these tapes go bad, if we send you anything defective, or if you lose one, write us P.O. Box 1086, Lakeview, Missouri, 65737. We thank you for listening, and this is your friend, Noah Fredericks. Let's hear from you.